You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Backernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, 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 Green Bay Packers are, uh, they won a game. hey <laughs> I mean, look, I, I've given this speech a thousand times now, which is becoming true of everything I've ever said, so I guess I don't need to put that caveat in there, because when you get 1,200 episodes, this tends to happen. But this happened a lot last year and the year before as well. There's a lot of hemming and hawing. There's a lot of yeah, but the defense, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but the missed passes, the this, that, and the other, whatever. I'll be honest, I don't really want to hear it. I I started listening to the CBS podcast just for something to do. I just picked the first one that was available that wanted to talk about this game. And um, like most fans, they were really um, not upset because they're not Packer fans, but they said that the defense was just kind of trash. Dude, I'm sorry. The score is 35 to 17. 35 to 17 means the offense and defense did a good job. I I don't know what else to tell you. I'm very, very sorry if that upsets you. No, it wasn't perfect. Clearly, it wasn't perfect. The only team that I can see that was perfect was the Buffalo Bills, who scored 35 points and allowed zero. That's basically perfect. Although, granted, 35 points, that's what we got, and our offense sputtered quite a bit. So apparently 35 points isn't good. So it should have been like 45, 50 something. I guess what I'm trying to say is, why are we expecting perfection at this point? I mean, I feel like once, before the, again, before the game, if I would have said it's not a perfect game, but we beat them 35 to 17, everybody would be happy. We beat them 35 to 17. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty freaking good. And for the most part, people are like, well, it was perfect. At what point did we switch from, Let's get back on track. Let's get a win at home. All these things to this better be a perfect game or I'm out. I'm not saying we can't critique a couple things moving forward, but within minutes and hours of basically blowing out the Lions at home after the embarrassing loss in week one, quite a few people are ready to criticize and say we're never going to beat X, Y, and Z and all that kind of stuff. And I, I guess, I'll, I'll, and I said this last night when I did my my stream, um, can we, can we give ourselves a day? Can we give ourselves one day to look at this and say it was a good effort? Because it was. And like I said last night too, it's, you know, look at Indiana, uh, Indianapolis and LA, right? 27-24 is the score in that game. How many people right now are saying LA is trash? Maybe some. But here's the bigger thing. Indianapolis, who lost their quarterback, scored 24 points. How do you go about scoring 24 points, you think? This is the thing that always annoys me, and and I think Packer fans are just extra sensitive about defense. Anytime anybody gets a first down, this defense is trash. If anybody gets a touchdown, this team is trash. Dude, everybody gets touchdowns. It happens to everybody, and how do you get a touchdown? You have sustained success down the field. Multiple first downs, another one, and another one. You're able to run the ball. You're able to pass the ball. Your corners that you love are, are giving up passes. This defensive line that you either love or you hate or whatever, talking about L.A., they're getting run over. And in the case of Indianapolis, again, who lost their quarterback in this game, supposedly number one defense in football, three times they were able to march all the way down the field, get touchdowns, and then add another field goal on top of it, and they nearly lost. How about the Cleveland Browns? You're trying to make a case that you're a really good team. The Houston Texans, who are supposedly supposed to be one of the worst in football, scored three touchdowns. Three times, again, this terrible team marched all the way down the field and scored touchdowns. Yeah, you beat them by 10, but so what? You're never going to go anywhere. The Bears defense, I said the Bears defense looked good, but apparently Cincinnati was able to drive down the field, score 17 points. Apparently the Bears defense is rubbish. 
Washington's pretty proud of their defense. The Giants scored 29. That's 12 more than we allowed, by the way. New England should be pretty proud. They only allowed six, but here's the thing. New England won 25 to six. That's basically the exact same margin that we won by. Everybody else is going to say New England blew out the Jets, but is anybody going to give the Packers credit? Apparently not. We got to stop, man. Here's ultimately what I think. I think to start this game, some things were kind of working. Had a little bit of rhythm, had a little bit of run the ball ability. I thought Aaron Rodgers was terrible. This is one of the arguments they had on CBS is um, one of the guys on there was raving about Rodgers and the other two guys are like, uh, he kind of didn't look super great in the first half. I mean, they were losing to the Lions and he rolls out a stat, something to the effect of like eight of 10 for 75 yards. Yeah, but those were all little dink and dunk passes. He couldn't complete anything down the field. There was an interception that was dropped. It was, it was bad. It felt... It, I remember at halftime saying things seem to be working, but Aaron Rodgers is broken. And when the defense finally did get a stop, Aaron Rodgers did nothing. And it was concerning because, I mean, it doesn't matter if everything else is working, even the defense. If Rodgers isn't playing any better than he was last time, it's going to be a real long day. But at some point, I don't know exactly when it was something. Oh, I do know exactly when it was. It was when he completed that pass to Devontae. Something seemed to click. Aaron Rodgers seemed more confident in the pocket, confident in his reads. His, his throws are a lot more crisp. There was still a little bit of iffiness. I mean, he couldn't hit MVS to save his life. There were two touchdowns left on the field because MVS just killed the guy. It was wide open, would have run, just walked into the end zone. Rodgers missed him twice. So he's not perfect. Still, it's, it's a little bit closer to 2019 Rodgers, um, whereas he, last week was like, uh, never seen Rodgers play that bad in my life, Rodgers. Hopefully by next week we get 2020 Rodgers. But the point is, something seemed to click at some point. And the same thing happened with a lot of other facets of this game, like the defense, for example. At some point, something clicked with the defense. And again, zero points in the second half. I'm sorry. I I know the Lions didn't do certain things, like they they fumbled the ball the one time and gave it to the pack. Okay, fine. I'm sorry, though. If you have a terrible defense, like we saw in the first half, the other team's going to score some points. They didn't run the ball very well, though, right? I mean, how many 20-yard chunks did they get on the ground? Any? Third and two entire quarters. How many times did Jared Goff rip off 50 yard passes for touchdowns against Kevin King or Stokes or anybody? Did he do that once or zero times? Because I think it was zero times. I get the Lions aren't good, but there is no argument for how bad this defense was in the second half when they give up zero points. There just is nothing. And so I'm fine critiquing the team when they're bad. I'm not okay with critiquing the team when they're good. So all I'm saying is let's, uh, let's see where we're at here. Let's give it a minute. Let's let it ruminate. Let's let it marinate. Let's see if maybe something's real. I know the Lions suck. So what? How many do they score against the 49ers again? This team that we're supposed to be scared of for some reason. I don't really know why, other than I'm scared of the Packers collapsing, not because the 49ers are good at football necessarily. We'll get to that. Might as well just get to it now because we're here. But that just baffles me. So again, let, let, let's talk about the 49ers because this is the team we're supposed to be super scared of. Next. I'm super scared of the Packers not showing up. I really am. No question about it. And I don't want to move on to next week too much, but I, I just, I don't understand the whole, well, we beat a bad team, but the 49ers are like this dominant, elite, massive force that's unstoppable and we're never going to be able to beat them. Okay, let's talk about it. First of all, they beat the Lions 41 to 33. 33 points. How how do you feel about 33 points? Well, that was garbage time. The Lions had garbage time in this game too. How many points did they score? Was it zero? Because I think it was zero. They scored zero points in garbage time. So garbage time is this magical time when the offense is able to move the ball and score a million points, right? So does that make the Packers defense even better? See what I mean? Like there's always excuses that fall in the favor of other teams and never is given to our own team. And this is by our own fans that act this way and I don't get it. Lions had garbage time in this game. They didn't score any points. So what does that mean for our defense? Apparently nothing. The, the, we'll give the 49ers a pass, but we won't give the Packers defense any credit. That's crazy to me. And look, maybe the 49ers will end up being good, but, but what, is it, what is it based on exactly? And I, again, this is one of those weird things where everybody every year pretends the 49ers are good, and I don't really get why. Detroit, 41-33 is not good. I don't care about garbage time, any of that. You gave up 33 points to Detroit. Almost lost the game, by the way, to Detroit, who almost came back and beat you. Then, and it's like, well, they scored 41 because they have this great offense. Okay, cool. Then Philadelphia Eagles, you won 17-11. Where's that great offense again? Oh, yeah, it doesn't exist. You got 11 against Philly's great. 
but not so much the other way around. And by the way, almost lost to Philadelphia as well. These are close games. That's six points. One touchdown and you lost to Philadelphia because you couldn't get to 20. So, I mean, technically they're 2-0, and but they've played pretty terrible teams. I mean, I guess we don't know 100% how Philly is, but I'm pretty sure we're, we know that Philadelphia and Detroit are terrible. But again, we got to pretend not only is 40, the 49ers good, but they've got this great defense. Look, here's, here's what happened in 2019. They were 13-3. and three. They had the eighth-ranked defense and the second-ranked offense. Eighth-ranked defense. That's fine, right? It's top 10 technically, but it's not even in 2019. It wasn't the most dominant defense in football. It was eighth. Remember, we played the Rams last year. They were number one. This is eighth. But let's look at every year that isn't 2019 under Kyle Shanahan, this oh-so-elite, freakish uh, whatever he is. By the way, they ro- they lost Robert Sala, but we'll just pretend that that didn't happen too. Um, in, uh, let's see, 2017, their defense was 25th. In 2018, they were 28th, so one of the worst in football. 2019, again, they were great. 2020, they went back to 17th, so below average again last year. Uh, this year, so far, they're 10th, but again, that's against the Lions and the Eagles. So, again, am I worried about the Packers going out to San Francisco and not showing up and getting embarrassed? Of course I am. Am I worried about the 49ers being like the greatest team in football this year? Not so much, no. Not really. I'm not. Um, by the way, Green Bay beat them 34-17 to last year which is a thing that happened because it wasn't 2019, it was 2020, one of the years they were bad and not one of the years that they were good. Um, So there's that. And that was was in San Francisco, by the way. So I understand some hesitation, but we give, I'm just saying we give the 49ers way too much credit. Way too much credit. It's a little silly. I've got Mr. Negative up this morning talking about how the 49ers are so much better than us. And he mentioned, well, we don't, the the, the reason they're better is because they don't get gouged on the ground like we do. We have Lancaster and Lowry. Um, I did the math. It looks like we gave up 108 yards. 49ers last week gave up 116 yards to the Lions. So similar, but they gave up more. Also, considering the 49ers were up by a lot and it was a lot of garbage time, doesn't that mean they turned to the passing game earlier? So they abandoned the run, but still ended up with more yards on the ground. I'm just reading the numbers, man. And then this past week, they gave up 151 yards to the Eagles. Most of that was Jalen Hurts, but still yards given up on the ground. So I, I don't know, man. I, don't, I, I mean, if you can't be happy about it, I don't really know how to help you, I guess. But again, that that's sort of my takeaway. The thing started off slow, and then you started to see it in the, uh, the second half. Uh, real quickly, we'll rip through a couple stats, and then we'll continue on after the break. Aaron Rodgers uh, ended the game 22 of 27, 255 yards, 9.4 average, four touchdowns. That, by the end of the thing, fantastic game. 145.6 passer rating. I mean, it's hard to do much better than that. Again, it started off kind of slow, and most of slow just meant smaller, shorter passes, which, by the way, the reason they're doing that is because the Lions are daring us to do that. The San Fran, or the, the New Orleans Saints gave a game plan, which is not even a new game plan. They, they were kind of following a template as well, but it's play two deep safeties, take away the, the, the passing game, at least the, the deep passing game, force them to run the ball and dump the ball off. That's what we did. And, and like I said yesterday, you could feel the tension. You could feel Aaron Rodgers want to drive the ball. But fortunately, unlike last week, we just didn't. We just took what was given to us, and, and the run game was a little bit better. Now, I'm still a little bit upset with the, the rushing ability. It was good enough, but if a team is basically daring you to run and they're saying, we're going to play light in the box and see if you can even handle it, we should be taking chunks out of their, you know, their, their flesh, I guess. We'll, you know, just complete the, it's what I was thinking. I guess I'll just say it. I don't know why I was thinking that, but we should, we should be ripping chunks off. But at the end of the day, it was good enough. Now, I, I do think moving forward against not necessarily the, the elite of the elite, but let's just say better than the Lions, um, we're going to have to be able to push guys around because I think when you get to the 49ers and especially the Steelers who have a great front and a, at least one obviously elite safety in Minka, they can do a lot of stuff. And if they decide we can play two safeties and win, or even we can just do single high and whatever they decide to do, um, because they trust, let's say their front, which is unbelievably freaking good to say, we're just going to rush our four and we're going to be able to get home. And then we're just going to play coverage. We're going to have to be a team that can bully them and push them around a little bit. We're going to have to be. You're going to get a couple of yours. That's fine. But 
if you don't if you don't knock this off, you're going to lose. Needs to be what the Packers respond with. And 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 what we're looking for is for a team to kind of be a little bit more balanced. Sometimes they play this, sometimes they play that based on the situation. But we're we're still in that zone where teams are are saying we're not going to change. We're going to do one thing because we don't trust that you're good enough. You know, we talk a lot about the offensive line. We talk a lot about Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon and how much we love these guys. But NFL football teams are telling us, you guys suck. Aaron Jones sucks. Your offensive line sucks. And we're not scared of them. That has to change. And again, it worked today um, against the Lions, but it, it needs to be continued, sustained success against everybody to be able to just push guys out of the way. Um, Speaking of running backs, um, Aaron Jones, 17 carries, 67 yards, 3.9 average. Again, not terrible, but that's subpar for Aaron Aaron Jones, and it needs to be better than that. He added one touchdown. His longest run was nine yards. Not a lot of big big gainers either, which is a little frustrating, especially when you're kind of, as the game rolls on and the defense is supposed to get worn out, you know, take a couple. Again, chunks. I don't know why chunks is on my brain. Uh, Aaron Rodgers added four carries, six yards, 1.5 average. A.J. Dillon, only five carries, 18 yards, 3.6. A lot of people down on A.J. Dillon. What I've learned about A.J. Dillon is he he takes, he's, I mean, he's literally a freight train, but he's a lot like a freight train. Takes him a while to get going. And if he has only four, five, six carries, you're not going to see much from him. We've never seen him have a great game with five carries. He's the kind of guy that it takes him a while. He's very Eddie Lacy-like. You know, Eddie Lacy always started slow. He started slow in the season, slow in the game. But you give him a handful of carries, he eventually it's like, oh, there's the big one. And then he builds off of that and builds off of that. I thought A.J. Dillon was fine. Again, 3.6 average is basically the same as, as Aaron Jones. Um, it also still baffles me that whenever A.J. Dillon is on the field, the offensive line can't block. I don't know if the defense just rushes nine because they know it's a handoff because we're just tipping our hand or what the deal is, but... He's constantly getting attacked in the backfield, and I think the best run of the entire night was A.J. Dillon getting about five yards on what should have been a four-yard loss because he got hit the second he touched the ball, broke like half the defense's tackles, and still pulled ahead and and ran another whatever it was, four or five yards. That was ridiculous. By the way, just snap counts in general, Aaron Jones, 45 snaps to A.J. Dillon's 19, to Kylan Hill's 5. Kylan Hill also kind of jumping the gun a little bit. I thought he looked pretty good. Um, running the ball, he looked fine. He reminded me of, of again, kind of an Aaron Jonesy kind of a running back. Kind of slippery, just snakes his way up a couple extra yards. Again, nothing super fantastic, but uh, it was something. Kylan Hill, two carries, eight, eight yards, four-yard average. Jordan Love, the worst player of the day, um, three carries, negative three yards. Just can the guy. Get rid of him. He's horrible. That's a joke, obviously, who's kneeling. That's where that came from. Um, receiving our, uh, let's see, they sort these in weird ways. I don't think I want to use that. But uh, obviously, Devontae was the man. Nine targets, eight receptions, 121 yards. No touchdowns, but that's fine. It was Aaron Jones's day. Aaron Jones, speaking of, six targets, six receptions, 48 yards, eight yards per route run, and, or not per route run, per route, and... Uh, Per reception, here we go, and three additional receiving touchdowns on top of it. His longest was only 13 yards, but again, Aaron Jones is the reason we won the game. Somebody made that comment on uh, on YouTube, and I kind of kind of lashed out because I felt like it was a negative comment. But the reason we won the game is because we needed Aaron Jones to have a big day. We needed to be able to win with that underneath stuff, and we did. We threw the ball to Aaron Jones. We ran the ball with Aaron Jones, and as long as we're able to continue to do that, Teams cannot do what they keep doing. Plus, nobody wants to lose that way. You're gas in your own defense. If, if, the, if the other team is, is able to successfully move the ball down the field by taking four or five-yard chunks, you're in a lot of trouble. And based on how you know inaccurate Aaron Rodgers has been on a couple of those throws, maybe you want to challenge him, but I doubt any team will ever say, I, I, I don't think Rodgers is going to complete. Because if nothing else, he, can, he never misses Devontae. That's the funny thing. Whenever you see him uncork a ball down the field... Look at who the receiver is to see if it's going to be complete. If it's MVS, he probably overthrew it. If it's Devontae, you know it's going to be in stride. Um, Snap counts for the wide receivers. Devontae Adams, 57. MVS, 43. Alan Lazard, 42. So they're still like 1 or 2A and 2B right there. Randall Cobb, only 12 snaps. But um, the interesting thing about Randall Cobb, and, and, you know, I mentioned last week, maybe I was a week early, how Aaron Rodgers is going to kind of force feed Randall Cobb a little bit. Kind of crazy, the um, target percentage. He was out there on the field only 12 times. Only six times did he run routes, and he was targeted three times. 
50% of the times he ran routes, he was targeted. That's insanely high. By the way, um, Randall Cobb kind of doing what we wanted Randall Cobb to do. Not necessarily a high producer, but um, if he just wants to come in and be Geronimo Allison and catch third round passes, I'm fine with that. You know, we need a clutch play. The play broke down. I need somebody to come open. Guess who it is? It's Randall Cobb converting first down. So again, it's funny because 12 snaps, six routes run, three targets, two first down receptions, if if I'm remembering that properly. Malik Taylor also three snaps, zero routes run. So he's coming in blocking. Equinemius, six snaps, only ran routes one time and was targeted on that one play and didn't go anywhere. I don't know why I didn't finish this, these statistics. Uh, Tunyon, three targets, three receptions, 52 yards, and a touchdown. I thought he had a, a really good day. Again, Tunyon, I still think, is a very up-and-down guy. Sometimes he shows up and sometimes he doesn't, but um, I really liked what he was doing. It, it just it, You saw his versatility a little bit more. It wasn't just like in the past when he was just schemed open a lot, because I personally have a hard time caring about that. It's like anybody can get schemed open. You know, Anybody can run a route and be like, oh, dude, there's nobody here. That's crazy. Thanks, Matt. But in this game, there were a couple things that he did that really were impressive. I thought his uh, play fake when he was blocking off the edge, waited for Aaron Rodgers to turn his head and then throws the defender to get himself open. I thought that was beautiful. Um, Breaking ankles out there. I thought, you know, the actual after the catch ability was pretty phenomenal. Um, And then that touchdown reception. I mean, that was it was a strike from Rodgers, but another great catch from him as well. Uh, let's see, Randall Cobb's stats on the day, three targets, three receptions, 26 yards. A.J. Dillon had one great toe-tapping catch uh, for eight yards. That was a, a real clutch reception. And then defensively, um, the defense was out there, obviously, for 57 snaps. The guys that played all 57, you had Devondre Campbell, who had an unbelievable day, Adrian Amos and, Dar- and Darnell Savage, obviously, and then Jair Alexander, 57 snaps apiece. Um, among those guys, Devondre Campbell, they credited with 10 tackles, or excuse me, 13 tackles, 10 of them solo. He had an interception for two yards as well as a pass deflection. Adrian Amos had nine tackles, uh, and that was it. Jair had four tackles, three solo. Darnell Savage, two tackles. And then uh, Kevin King had his, he was out there for 56 snaps, only one play he came off the field. He did have a pass deflection. I know a lot of people were mad, but he's another guy that I I guess the point is it's hard to say the defense gets a pass because they finally figured it out in the second half, but then not give Kevin King that same amount of slack. You don't have to, but it's just, it's, it's a sticking point for me. It's not really fair. The whole defense was trash in the first half, basically. And then they got better in the second half. And it's like, I just have a hard time being like, yeah, but Kevin, you don't get a pass because I just don't like you. Kenny Clark played 48 snaps. So we went going down quite a bit. Uh, five tackles, uh, Four of them were solo. No statistics here to mark or to talk about. Eric Stokes played 44 snaps. Obviously a massive jump. Still not quite as much as Kevin King, but kind of a weird new alignment that they're working with. I guess it's not weird. It just makes sense. But the the question has finally been answered. How do we get Eric Stokes and Kevin King on the field? Well, we got to put Jair in the slot and let's see how it goes. Now, maybe this is just kind of an experimental kind of thing, because as I said, and I kind of mentioned that, I think, in the podcast, if you're going to try to experiment with stuff, this is a great game to do it. The thing is, though, they're not going to keep... I, don't, I can't imagine they're going to keep Jair in the slot when most premier players are on the, on the boundary. If you want to have Jair follow guys in the slot or play against guys who have really good slot wide receivers, to at, at the very least as good as any guy they have in the boundary, fine. Um, but he doesn't stay in the slot. There's no way in the world we're going up against these subpar slot receivers, putting Jair in the slot and leaving King and Stokes on the boundary with the top two receivers. Just, they can't do that. They just can't. So I like the experiment. That's great. Um, Stokes, by the way, credited with uh, one tackle, but two pass deflections. It was a, a, a dispute about how many pass deflections he had. But I looked at the statistics Yesterday, and again, let me just refresh this to see if the grades are out yet. Uh, they're not. The There are only about four guys, I think, that have three pass deflections in the NFL right now. Eric Stokes had one last week. He had, PFF is giving him two this week. That means three. That means he's tied for number one. And he only had eight snaps left. He's not even a starter, basically. Um, he's played like, well, one game, I guess, essentially. If you add eight to this... They're right at about full-time snap. So he's played basically one game and is leading the NFL in pass breakups. So that's not a bad thing for the rookie. 
Uh, Chris Barnes played 25 snaps, so obviously Devondre Campbell is the top guy, and you can see why. He had a, again, phenomenal game. I'm hoping he can keep that up again. I know it's just um, I know it's just the Lions, but at the same time, that they have TJ. TJ Hawkinson is not, you know, when we talk about the Lions as being garbage, um, H- Hawkinson is clearly not one of those garbage players. By the way, the offensive line is not that bad. They're not premier, but they, they're, it's a competent offensive line to be sure. Better than a lot of other ones out there. Um, Jared Goff is not a garbage quarterback. He's not a premier quarterback, but he's not garbage. You know, I mean, we, we talk about the Lions as though they're like the Texans, where they just have literally nothing. No offensive line, no, although they have, you know, do they have wide receivers? I think they have one, right? I don't know. It doesn't matter, but but uh, Jonathan Garvin had 13 snaps coming in and spelling our edge rushers. TJ Slayton played six. A lot of people are really mad about that. I can't be mad because I don't know TJ Slayton is a good football player. I mean, I, I get it. I get that people want something better along the defensive line, but we don't know TJ Slayton is better. We don't know if he's even good at football. I have no idea. Uh, Oren Burks played two snaps. Henry Black played two snaps. I'm thinking Henry Black is the guy that I was thinking of. Is he number 39? Because that was pathetic. (laughs) That that unbelievably horrible missed tackle by somebody that I didn't recognize the number, um, who then stayed out, I think, the next play, and I didn't see him again. So that would be the two snaps. But oh my goodness, that was about as bad as I've I've ever seen. But anyways, I'm going to go ahead and take a break right here. We'll come back on the other side. Got a couple other things to look at. Maybe they'll sneak in these PFF grades so we can kind of get a little bit of a peek. Um, We'll save a lot of that for tomorrow, but I obviously want to see that quite badly. But anyways, uh, if you want to support the podcast, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. You can support this very podcast for as little as $1 a month. That's it, man. And as I said, if every single one of you got together and like, you know what? This guy's driving me nuts. Let's all just give him a buck buck a month. We can do a buck. Let's just do it. And then then he has to stop because there's literally, he's not asking anybody because we all signed up already. No point in even bringing it up. Then it's like ad free, at least my one ad. The rest of them are going to stay. But here's here's the best part. I don't have to go to work tomorrow. (laughs) Just get together today, all of you. I know you guys all hang out. Just get together as a group. And if one guy's like really on hard times, you know, like I'm going through some stuff, maybe somebody else just does $2. Just cover it. Right? And then Everybody that listens, which right now I think we're sitting at about 26000 a month, buck a month, if 25% of you follow through, I'm not going to work tomorrow. If 100% of you follow through, I will be on the beach tomorrow, literally tomorrow. I'm not kidding. I mean, I can make those proclamations because it'll never happen, but legitimately, I would just go to my wife and say, um, we, we have to go to Florida right now. And if you don't want to come, I understand. Um, I have to go. This is something I have to do. I have to bring a folding table and a chair and a cheese hat and a swimsuit, and I have to go to the beach, and I have to record a podcast, and then if you want me to come home, I'll just jump on the next flight and I'll come home. But I'd rather not, if you wouldn't mind meeting me out there at some point. That'd be great. Oh, but we dream. Anyways, we'll take a break, and uh, we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details i want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor factor Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. 
Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. PFF is lacking, man. Um, anyways, couple things here. We've got um, some pretty cool little tidbits, insights, et cetera, et cetera, literal insights. NFL.com does these, and I love that. They've got some like instant cool statistics to show everybody, which kind of stinks because I like finding these, but it's, it's all in one place, so I don't have to. Aaron Jones became the first running back in Packers history with three-plus receiving touchdowns and a rushing touchdown in a single game. First running back in Packers history. Broke history today. Amazing. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is 7-0 and following a loss under head coach Matt LaFleur since 2019. Rodgers has four-plus passing touchdowns, zero interceptions in the next game after each of his last five losses. That's pretty incredible stat. Um, the Lions have lost five straight against the Packers, which obviously is a fantastic stat for all of us. Packers are 15-2 and at home under head coach Matt LaFleur, which is the highest win percentage in the NFL. 15-2 and at home. I mentioned that, I think, yesterday on the podcast or a couple days ago or whatever, stunned at how high their their win rate is at home. I didn't realize they were that good. Packers are 12-1 and versus NFC North under head coach Matt LaFleur, only one loss, and that was to Minnesota in 2020. The Lions are 0-5 in primetime games against Aaron Rodgers, in which they led at halftime. The Rodgers, by the uh, Rodgers or the Packers, by the way, are undefeated in prime or Monday Night Football. Anyways, Aaron Rodgers tied Drew Brees 27 for the most games with four plus passing touchdowns and a 125 plus passer rating since 1950. So um, again, we're oh, he hasn't quite broke it, but he tied it. He'll break it next week. Don't worry about it. Aaron Jones is the first player since at least 1950 with four scrimmage touchdowns in a single game versus the Lions. The Lions have allowed 30-plus points in eight straight games dating back to 2020, longest streak in franchise history. It's always a, You know it's always a good day when they do these things and every single thing about the Packers is positive, every single one is, is negative for the uh, Lions, except T.J. Watt, or excuse me, T.J. Hawkinson, but I'm not going to bother reading it. Um, So anyways, those are a couple little insights into that game. Some pretty cool little tidbits. A couple other little insights into the, at least statistical insights. Uh, Time of possession, Packers won 33 to 26. Ran 61 offensive plays to their 56, which is, again, nice. It's a big difference than than last week, and I think it's important to do that. And again, that's kind of what the Lions are handing us, or, or the Saints, or anybody else that decides to play this way. You still have to execute, and it's a lot harder to take small chunks all the way down the field. But when you do it, if you do it, you're winning time of possession and you're keeping your defense on the sideline and you're keeping their defense on the field. And again, the Lions are just shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, we won the penalty battle 5-9, five, five for 50 yards. They had 9 for 78. Won the turnover battle 2-0. to zero. Um, Obviously, they had the fumble, the one fumble loss and uh, the interception by Devondre Campbell. Sacks were in the Lions' favor. Obviously, that still needs to get cleaned up. I don't know if that's Aaron Rodgers or if that's the offensive line or a combination of both or the wide receivers not getting open. I don't know. But uh, three sacks to one. We had three sacks for 28 yards. They had one for 10. Again, yards per carry on average, they had 5.7. We had 3.1. Needs to be better than that. Total first downs, we had 25. They had 19. Uh, Third down efficiency, we are 56%. They were 44%. We were 5 of 9. They were 4 of 9. Uh, fourth down, we didn't try any, but they were 0 for 2, which is fantastic for our defense. Again, give credit where it's due. Red zone, both teams were 100%. They were 2 for 2. We were 4 for 4. Uh, looking at the punting, we punted three times. They punted twice. Um, on average, they had 53.5 yards. We had 46.7. I thought, uh, Bajorquez did a pretty good job. He did have one kind of ugly punt, but the other ones were so perfect. It was pretty incredible. Not just distance-wise, but 
I mean, just smoking it right, like, just, he hit the five, like, every time. It was pretty incredible. Um, kick returns, each had two. They had 54 total yards. We had 60. Pretty incredible that we actually won that battle, especially considering one of their returns was a pretty big return, but we had, uh, well, we had two of them, so, so there. Their longest was 33 yards. We had the 41-yarder. One of those was, I think, called back on a, uh, on a penalty, but still, very good job by Kylan Hill. Um, PFF, again, they don't have all their stuff done, but they did put together a little nice little package for us. Um, he did have two big-time throws in the game as turnover-worthy plays. They put it 3%, which I don't like that they use one as a whole number and one as a percentage, but whatever. doesn't give me an idea of which was which or how which one was better. But uh, they wrote, every time Aaron Rodgers struggles in a game, he rebounds with a monster statistical performance in the next, and this game was no different. His stats may be inflated as one of his four touchdowns was a tap pass to the running back on jet motion, but Rodgers had a couple of exceptional big-time throws and finished the game with 9.4 yards per attempt. The Again, the 3% turnover-worthy play thing is not great, but I don't know if that's like one pass or two passes or what exactly that is. We know at least one for sure that was a dropped interception, but for the most part, seemed fairly clean from what I can see. Uh, Devontae Adams, they had him at 3.9 yards per route run, which is quite incredible. That's not per reception. That's every time he ran a route, he's getting about four yards. That's not, I mean, that's, that's just a perpetual first down. Every single time he runs a route, you can account for him getting about four yards. That's insane. They did go on to say, arguably his best play, however, came when he prevented the only turnover worthy, oh, so it was one, only turnover worthy play of Rodgers' day resulting in an interception. That was incredible. I almost tweeted right after that, defensive player of the game, Devontae Adams. His ability to reach back, his put his arm behind his back and still swat the ball out of the defender's hand was incredible. Devontae's such a special guy. I mean, he just, he's so like, how do you say it? The mind-body connection is so ridiculous. Like he thinks it and it just happens. His ability to use his feet, his legs, his arms, his hands, you know, his, just everything is so, it's, it's very Christian McCaffrey-esque, where it's just, everything is effortless. He saw the ball was behind him, and he's like, oh, better swat that away, blindly puts his hand behind his back, puts his hand square in the middle of the ball and swats it down like no big deal. It's, it's kind of freaky how good he is. Here's what they had to say about our offensive line, which again, is always a question, But it says Green Bay's offensive line has had to deal with a lot of turnover, but it remains an excellent pass-blocking unit, particularly with Rodgers able to control the pocket so well. Two of the starting five allowed no pressure at all, and the group surrendered just six total pressures pending review. So three of those turned into sacks, which makes it seem more than than what it is because it's 50% of it, but still, that ain't bad. Six pressures. They had, uh, what was it, 10 or so last week? So an improvement. Um, for the defensive line, they said with no Zadarius Smith in the game, it was an opportunity for others to step up and fill the void, but no one was able to consistently do so. Rather, the Packers were able to generate pressure as a collective, as four different players recorded multiple pressures without any recording more than four. Rashawn Gary led the team in pressure, pending review, winning on 19.2% of his pass rush reps. Again, I, there's some people who are, who are mad about it saying, well, it's not good enough, I want sacks. It's, it's hard, again, to not look at it on an individual level. I saw many times where Rashawn Gary was right there, and the ball came out in, in two seconds. There's only so much a guy can do. If the ball is going to consistently come out early because our guys can't cover for like 1.5 seconds, Rashawn Gary's never going to get a sack. And it's not only his fault, but again, 20% of the time he's winning. That's, a, that's solid. I don't know what his pressure rate is um, because that's his win rate, but last week his win rate and his pressure rate were basically identical because every time he beat the guy, he got some form of pressure. But so far on two different weeks, he's winning consistently against the guy across from him. They're not converting for one of two reasons. And again, it's the same two reasons every time. I mean, listen, let's just think about it logically. If you're getting a pressure, you're right there. So why isn't he tackling him? Have you ever seen him get to the quarterback and just miss a tackle? Because I have not. Like he just dives at him and he, he, he's got him squared up and he's just standing there like a sitting duck and he hits him head on, but the quarterback just doesn't move because it was a weak tackle and Rashawn just falls to the ground like, oh, I tried. That's never happened. So what is the reason? There's only two reasons. Number one, the ball comes out. Number two, he's able to run the other direction because there's no help on the other side. So I get stomping our feet and saying, well, it's not good enough. Pressure isn't good enough. I need sacks. All right, fine. But it's not Rashawn's fault. You want sacks, our guys have to cover for a couple seconds. When Aaron Rodgers gets sacked, it's because he's holding the ball for four seconds or longer, and there's nobody there, and then here comes the line. If, if they ever, if, if, if the quarterback ever held the ball for four or five seconds, you'd start to see pressure. Well, not all the time. Sometimes he does, but every single time we get pressure, nobody's covering. 
And if there is, there's a wide open hole to the other side. And that's the other problem, again, with what I said, where this feels a little bit more Dom Capersy. And Pettin was a little bit more concerned about this. We don't want to let him escape the pocket, so we got to slowly compress it, which means less overall pressures because we're not just playing wild and crazy. And Rashawn is playing a lot like Clay Matthews, where sometimes he just rips around and he does beat the guy. But now the quarterback can step up in the pocket and, and rush to the side and run for 42 yards. Why is he able to do that? Because the defensive tackles are not pushing the pocket with Rashawn. There's no linebackers there. There's no defensive tackles there. And so you can't have it both ways. It's a double-edged sword. Either we let him run free and um, hope that the quarterback doesn't have anywhere to run to, or we say, you got to kind of stay in your lane. And by the way, that's what Rashawn started doing at the end. He stopped trying to run around the guy and he ran right through him. And it looked like every single play down the stretch, he grabbed the tackle by the throat and pushed him right back into Jared Goff. And maybe that just needs to be the thing because it's hard to run around that. It's also hard to tackle the quarterback when you got a giant 300 pound man in front of you. But at least it's a pressure. You're probably not going to get a sack doing that. But you get the quarterback off his spot, and he's got nowhere to run to. So, yeah, they, they got to figure out a way to get the quarterback down. But if he's still generating that amount of pressure, I just, I, for me, it's everybody else needs to step up. The, the, the quarterback needs to have not have a spot to go in 1.25 seconds, and there needs to be no wide open field on the other side to run away and be like, well, I have somebody coming on that side. I better run with 40 yards of green grass in front of me and uh, maybe go pick up some yards. Uh, They were talking about the linebackers, Devondre Campbell, 56 snaps on defense, more than double the rest of their linebackers combined. The Packers led the league in dime, six defensive backs, personnel rate last season, but didn't run a single snap of it in this, of, of it, this preseason. Who cares about preseason? Against Detroit, they broke it out again. They said running with six defensive backs on 33.9% of their snaps, which left Campbell to man the middle of the field. He made 10 tackles and five defensive stops. So again, there's... They're still trying to figure out what best to do, which stinks because it's like, I hate to be experimenting at this point, but we don't know who our corners are. We're still trying to iron out which linebackers play what. We still don't know if we're going to be playing dime, nickel, base, whatever. We're just, we're throwing a lot of stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And hopefully some things start to stick. Now, as many of you pointed out, one of the most disappointing things to hear through this whole uh, thing yesterday was the fact that Matt LaFleur had to tell our defensive coordinator that he has to bring extra pressure because this is unacceptable. This is the same thing that happened with Pettin last year and is the reason I said he needed to be fired. As scared as I am of firing Pettin and having a worse defense, which we may have at this point, you cannot have your head coach having to tell your defense what to do, your defensive coordinator what to do during game day. He's got his own responsibilities. He cannot also be the defensive coordinator especially on something so obvious. It's not like it's some kind of deep concept that he's like, why don't we run this crazy thing? You know, the annexation of Puerto Rico or whatever. No, it's, hey, how about you bring an extra guy, dummy, because we're not getting any pressure. And by the way, as soon as that happened, that's when the defense started to, to wake up. But again, it's, why, did, why does Matt LaFleur have to tell you that? Every single one of us was watching the game screaming it. Stop rushing three, stop rushing four. They're not getting home. Bring an extra guy. I know you're scared about, well, then we're losing a guy on the back end. So what? You can have 15 guys out there. If you're going to give him 10 seconds to throw the ball, he's going to find somebody anyways. You have to have pressure. It is not negotiable. Anyways, the final note on the secondary. First round pick Eric Stokes again looked impressive and would be pushing to start over King if the team wasn't using them both extensively already. Stokes was targeted four times, allowing just one five-yard catch. Um, a touchdown that came out of busted coverage in the end zone due to miscommunication with Kevin King. And again, I don't know 100% that that was Stokes. As uh, my half Mexican lawyer pointed out when I talked to him, he believes it was Stokes because he saw Stokes turn around and freak out. But it's also possible that he ran after his guy, saw Kevin King covering him and was like, um, what are you doing? And then realized there's a guy that's open on the other side and turned around and booked it. There's one of two things that happens. Either you follow your guy or you stay in your area. It probably was Stokes, but I don't know. And maybe the coach has already addressed it and said that it was Stokes' fault. But the other thing that I talked about yesterday is it's not even that bad of a thing. If if you look at his statistics and say, this is him, this one reception for a touchdown was him being, he didn't lose. He made a mental error. That's kind of awesome. I mean, you don't want that to continue, but if we just chalk it up to he's a rookie doing rookie stuff and made a simple error, but every single time he actually did what he was supposed to do and locked into a guy, he didn't lose. That's not a bad thing. By the way, they do have uh, 23% they were in base, 43% they were in nickel, and 34% they were in dime. So primarily nickel, 
then it would be dime, and then it would be base. That's what they did against... Um, I wonder if they have for last week. doesn't look like they put it for last week, so I don't exactly know, but interesting enough. Still no PFF grade, so we're going to call it. Um, be sure to follow me on Twitter because I'm going to be blasting out a ton of information on there. But uh, Packers won, man. Feel happy. You don't have to start stressing about 49ers. You don't have to rage and be angry about the the defense giving up 17 points. You're allowed to be happy. Give yourself a day before you start trying to fine-tune and critique. Everything's going to be fine. Like I... Like I've consistently said, if I would have told you prior to this game, we're going to win 35 to 17, everybody be doing backflips. But then watching them get 17 points, everybody loses their mind. There's some kind of a weird disconnect in our brains where 17 points is totally acceptable unless you actually watch the 17 points. And then it's like, that was not accept. That's not good enough. I'm sorry. It's just, it's weird. I don't, I don't know. But anyways, you guys have a great day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.